the weightlifting, and the weightlifting would take first, go on first, and the bodybuilders would not come on till midnight. They were like second-class citizens. Joe wanted to give bodybuilders the proper respect and forum. I said, I want to be Mr. America. And he says, why don't you join my, why don't you enter my contest? And it was the IFBB. And it was just, a, just starting, just the idea. And I thought, I didn't say it to him, but I thought, who wants to win IFBB? <laughs> who knows IFBB? I want to win AAU, Mr. America. That's what I want. I said, no, Joe. I said, I got my heart set on AAU. He says, you can't win that. I says, why not? And he says, because that's fixed. He picks who, get, who wins that contest. And I said, well, I think I can do it. I, I still can. So, and I met um, Isaac Berger, who was a power lifter. And he says, I know Bob Hoffman. He says, you got to meet him. you got to get to know him. you got to get in good with Bob Hoffman or you'll never win his contest. So he said, the next Mr. America, which was in Santa Monica, in which Joe Benda won it, he says, you come backstage after that contest, and I'll introduce you to Bob Hoffman. I said, all right, great. So we went backstage at the AU, and he took me up to Bob Hoffman, and he says, Bob, there's someone here that wants to meet you. Larry Scott would like to meet you. And uh, Bob Hoffman turned around, he looked at me, and he said, oh, yes, I've seen him in other magazines. And turned his back on me. Isaac Berger walked off, and I'm standing there on stage, He's got his back turned to me, and this leaves me there. And I thought, I walked off. And I thought, here I'm talking to Joe Weider, and he's giving me all this help and encouragement and everything. He turns his back on me when I want to enter his contest. I said, that's it. I'm done with AAU. Joe Weider, you know, he was a visionary. and. He established the Mr. Olympia contest in 1965, and the reason he established it, it, there was two federations, and you could win Mr. America once, and that was it. You could win the IFBB Mr. Universe, but then there was nowhere for these guys to go. So he said, I want to create the ultimate bodybuilding competition, and he was having dinner with Larry Scott in 1964. We were sitting there having dinner, and we started talking about and I had just won the universe, and they were, they said, we need to design it. We need to come up with a contest in which all the Mr. Universes can compete in. All the Mr. Americas Mr. Universe can compete against one another and see who is the best in the world. Because that's a great idea. Because maybe we get maybe we get Bill Pearl and these other guys that were our heroes to come in. I'd like to see how I would stand up next to them. And Joe says, look, we're going to get a new competition. And uh, what are you going to call it, Larry said. And they were drinking Olympia beer. This is a true story. And Joe said, well, call it Mr. Olympia. Yeah, let's not call it that. That's a beer. Let's call it something that's, that sounds um, health-producing or something, like Mr. Broccoli. <laughs> that was what I said. <laughs> but something better than Olympia. Well, anyway, I lost. I voted on it. He says, no, Olympia. He says, think of Mount Olympus, like the grandeur of that. And he says, yeah, yeah, I can see that. And so we decided then there to call it Mr. Olympia. Now, if they'd have been drinking Schlitz Moltail, we'd have had Mr. Schlitz Moltail now. You know? Well, let's see. I won the, the uh, first Mr. Olympia in 1965, and they provided a $1,000 gift. First time. I mean, were, you had to pay your own way to get the show. You had to pay your own flights, uh, everything. You, you, didn't, you had to have a job, too, because... Uh, Nobody was paying for your supplements or anything like that. You had to get have a job, so you worked, go to went to time to the gym, go to school. I had to I had to rush from the school over to the gym, get my workout done. Then when then when so when Joe uh, gave you a thousand dollar gift, that was great, man. Thousand dollars was a lot of money then. And people still say Larry's effect on the audience. They've never witnessed anything like it. When his music came, he walked out in silhouette and just stood there. And of course, with those arms and those delts, you could tell it was Larry Scott and the hair. You know, he, he had his own particular shape. He had these great arms, um, great delts, and he posed, and the audience went nuts. They were standing on the chairs, jumping up and down, and people that were there, I wasn't there, say, it's just, it was like Beatlemania. It was just absolutely raucous. And I got a chance to meet Larry Scott and saw him pose from the audience, and wow, what a moment that was. I mean, you've probably read about that about Larry Scott, uh, his appearance there was just tremendous. I never saw it, never had the opportunity to go 
and see the Mr. Olympia when Larry, uh, Larry Scott won. But I remember reading religiously, and he was so impressive in those days. You know, he had that blonde, he had that real California look. The next year, we missed Olympia, and I said, I'm going to go in this one more year. Because I know that the happiness doesn't exist on the stage. It exists in the family. So I want to win it the second time, so at least I can say that it wasn't one time. And I won it twice. And uh, uh, then I'm going to retire. Larry won the Olympia in 65 and 66 in really outstanding fashion. But he was also aware of somebody coming up behind him real fast. After I, I was given the, the trophy, the second Olympia, I said, would you appreciate their, their loyalty and their adulation and everything? And that's what I told him. I told him from my heart. It was a great honor. It's not something that for a little Pocatello kid to get this kind of an honor. And I really appreciated him. And But tonight is my last contest. And Larry, you know, won the title those first two years, and then he decided to retire, had other things to do. And along came Sergio. When Sergio Oliva came onto the scene, his presence was impossible to ignore. Blessed with an enormous amount of raw talent and driven by a true warrior spirit, Oliva ascended the ranks of his contemporaries with a grace that made him seem almost unreal. His nickname, The Myth, was well earned. Joe said, I've got a, I got a fella here that I want to see you, I want you to meet. He's from Cuba. And he's got a great body. And Joe was always bringing those kind of things just to spur you on. And so Sergio Oliva came walking back. He couldn't speak any English at all then. He was just spoke Spanish totally. And, but I looked at his body and I thought, I am never going to beat this guy. I'd already decided I was going to quit, but I thought, I'm glad I'm quitting because I know I'm not going to beat this guy. He's got natural blessings in his body, his proportions, his size, everything. It was just magnificent. I've never seen a bodybuilder like him. I first met Sergio Oliva outside Gold's Gym when it was on 2nd Street in Santa Monica. That was the second location. And I still can remember these arms coming out of a Hawaiian shirt with a, a, a split in it in order to, to, to give him enough room for these huge arms. Sergio is one of the most gifted genetic bodybuilders there ever was. This huge chest, huge arms, flaring thighs, tiny waist, but he was just this incredible display of genetics and everybody was impressed. No, no, nobody's ever not been impressed by Sergio Oliva. Now, I, I had the good fortune of meeting Sergio and becoming friends with him early on. We competed in the 1966 Junior Mr. America contest in San Jose. That was the first national contest I'd ever competed in. I was 19 at the time. And when I met Sergio, I had never seen anybody that genetically gifted. Still to this day, I haven't. I will remember this. Sergio only weighed 197 pounds that day. Yet each one of his thighs measured 29 inches. His waist was only 27. He was so far advanced over the rest of us, everybody else could have just posed their ass off and Sergio could have stood there and he walked away with the contest. And Sergio just rewrote the books in terms of, you know, round muscle bellies on the small joints. He had this small head that made everything else look massive. You know, it's an illusion. I'd been to a couple of universes and seen all the guys, Arnold, Draper, Park, you know, and impressed, you know. The first time Sergio walked out, I just went back in my seat. The, he, he ambled out. There was this, is this human? You know, it was like some sort of holograph that had been made out. The roundness of the muscles, the small waist, the size of his arms when he hit the poses. I've never shot back in my chair at anybody since. You know, it was just amazing. Though Sergio Oliva was in the best shape of his life in the early 70s, he was succeeded handily by Arnold. As one titan faded and a new one rose into the spotlight, it was the IFBB that was slowly on the rise as the 1960s came to a close. Well, yeah, along came the 70s, and, and, you know, the culture of the country and the world was changing rapidly with, you know, pop music and everything. The Vietnam War was in full force, which then became such a political issue here in the States. And at that time, you know, when all sorts of wild things were happening, along came Arnold Schwarzenegger. 
sending a letter to Arnold. Arnold, Arnold called me back. Said, Joe, I don't have any money. I can't buy a ticket on the plane. I have nothing. All he had was his briefcase, you know, with his workout suit and shoes, nothing else. So along came Arnold, who was a blueprint for what you wanted in a bodybuilder, what Joe Weider wanted. You know, he wanted the best bodybuilder in the world to have charisma, a, a PR brain, a sense of humor, somebody who could connect with an audience. You could have almost written it and said, let's get this guy. I told him, he came, I don't want to go home, I want to stay here. I'm near Los Angeles, and movies and everything. That's what I want to be. I said, okay, I'll pay up for your ticket to the plane. And I had a little business there in, Fl in Florida. And he went to work and he worked. Uh, he wanted to go to school, college school. I gave him money, gave him everything he wanted. And of course, his nemesis was Sergio Oliva. And he competed one-to-one -one against Sergio several times, in which a lot of people think Sergio m maybe should have won. Just maybe. Uh, the problem with Sergio is that uh, he was dealing with Arnold, who is just the smartest bodybuilder on stage ever. At that time, that was the first contest that he was on his mark, he looked good, and Sergio was a little bit off, and everything was right. And, uh, and Arnold won, because I well remember, we went back to the hotel that night. It was me, Dave Draper, uh, Franco, and Arnold, and he kept saying over and over, I can't believe that I actually beat Sergio. That blew his mind that he actually had, had toppled Sergio, and then, of course, a few weeks later, he was able to beat him again at the Mr. Olympia. And it was really his decision you know, he won the Olympia in 1970 and through to 75 for six years, to then concentrate on the Olympia, that then made the Olympia between 70 and 75. That's when the Olympia took over as the contest to win, to decide who's the best physique on the planet. And then after that, you got Joe's publicity machine behind him. And there's a certain synchronicity about the whole thing. Joe got the guy he wanted. Arnold met the entrepreneur he needed. They, they both knew how to promote, you know, the sport as a business and, and make it, you know, more accessible to the public. The Olympia was established. Arnold started to train in Gold's gym. So he had this synchronicity of, you know, the world's best bodybuilders, Zane, Draper, Franco, all in the same gym. You can't be thinking about yourself. You cannot be worried about what's going on with you. You have to go, okay, I'm ready. I've done everything I can do. Now what's going on around me that I can take advantage of? And nobody was ever better at that than Arnold Schwarzenegger. Coming off of wins in 1973 for Mr. America and the IFBB Mr. Universe, Lou Ferrigno continued his winning streak in the following year's IFBB Mr. Universe and the Mr. International. That same year, he entered the first Mr. Olympia, taking second. But it was in 1975 that Ferrigno's fortunes began to take an unprecedented turn. 1974 was my first competition in the Mr. Olympia because I was currently the Mr. Universe twice. I won the IBB Mr. America, and I knew I was competing against Arnold because he was my idol. I really wanted to beat him. I was only 21, he was 20, 26. But I remember we competed together, even though he's much more superior. I only trained three months. I found out later why he trained a whole year for the competition. But I was on the same stage with him. In a matter of just a few years, I went from a kid who came 23rd place right on stage with the greatest Schwarzenegger. And I remember when I was on that stage with him, I said, this is such a big leap. No matter what happened in the competition, people were always going to look up to him and I. And it was incredible because it gave me the sense and the motivation to go push even harder, to train even harder. Guys like Arnold and I back 30, 40 years ago, most of the big guys would go into pro football. But Arnold and I were like the two biggest guys in bodybuilding, so when Pumping Iron came out, the public embraced us. It affected everyone. Like Franco, everybody got a lot of fame. But mostly I, because we were like the two, the giants of bodybuilding. And Arnold, Arnold always felt that eventually I was going to surpass him. He always said to me, if I had your body, no one would beat me for 15 years. 
So basically, the beauty about the two of us is that we got involved going the mainstream, going with the film. Like I did the Hulk, he did Terminator. So it made up the household name and it helped everyone out. With Schwarzenegger and Ferrigno both moving on in the wake of their newfound fame, the competitive stage had opened up once again. 1976 began with the birth of one of the sport's greatest rivalries, Frank Zane and Franco Colombo. Well, that year it could be me, Franco, and uh, I think Robbie Robertson, a couple other people. I really wanted to win that year because I trained the whole year. But doing the Hulk, the chain, it made me so well known because if I walk down the street, everybody knows me. Nobody's know who Franco is. So I made that decision. That's why I came back to competition because I wanted to stay in the game. But I could not pass the Hulk up because I was the Hulk my whole life. It's a wonderful opportunity. Unfortunately, it had to happen before I was able to compete. The bodybuilding has always been a progression. The prize money gradually crept up. In 76, I think the total prize money that Franco won was 5,000. Frank Zane and Franco never got on, even to this day. If you talk to them, Franco particularly, will tell you he beat Zane 20 times. Well, he never did. You know, Zane won more than Franco. But they were polar opposites in personality and physique. You know, um, Franco had a great back, striations. Um, so he, he won more on, you know, the, the impact. Zane was like a, a walking statue. You know, he, he had, he practiced his posing to per perfection. You know, there was there's, every pose was thought out so as that he'd, the waist would be kept slender, the, the leg would be splayed out to show the quadriceps and calves and everything. I think I was much more meticulous than anybody else that competed at that time and probably even now because that was my background. I was trained as in the sciences. I was prepared to teach chemistry. And so uh, uh, b because of that, my exposure to chemistry and my uh, analytical approach to everything with the journals and looking at things and correlating results with what I'm doing to achieve those results, uh, I, got, I got nicknamed the chemist. Frank basically was very dominant in the late 70s, you know, 77, 78, 79. He had a type of physique that was um, very acceptable to the average guy. And I don't mean in, in that in any kind of negative, but the average guy could say, hey, if I trained hard, I could probably look close to that. And you know, I, I basically had a goal. I wanted to make the most of my physique and go, go to the top, win Mr. Olympia. And however long it took. You know, 1977 was already my, what was it? My, the years I competed, 72, 74, 75, it was my fifth try for Olympia in 77. So five, six, and seven were the magic years for me, 77, 78, 79. And, um, but you know, it was all because my training conditions continued to improve. That was my goal. I knew that to get to the top, I'd have to have impeccable conditions for training. Everything had to be perfect, and it was. But Frank had, had class in his physique. In 1977, winning the Olympia meant a cash prize of $5,000 and the trophy which I, I got to learn later was the first year they gave out the Sandow Trophy. And so I'm the recipient of that, but I didn't know it at the time. And then, um, you know, winning it two more years after that, the, the prize money went up. It was, it doubled each year. Joe Weider will tell you, Joe and Betty Weider, you know, everybody thinks in the 70s, he, you know, Arnold was on the cover a lot. Zane was on the cover a lot. And most people think, oh, the Arnold covers would have sold more. Joe says, no, Frank was always the one who sold more. Until Arnold became a film star and, and everything, and that went to a different audience. He could have been the icon Joe was looking for if it had been the personality of Arnold, but that wasn't him, you know. In one decade, bodybuilding had skyrocketed from a growing sport to a booming industry. Fast on the heels of such unprecedented exposure came an age of rampant controversy, starting with the 1980 Mr. Olympia. That was the victory uh, that Arnold, the last Ar Olympia victory of Arnold in 1980, which was hugely, hugely uh, controversial. I've spoken to Arnold about that, and he's told me, you know, this is in the past two years or so. He was a little bit annoyed. Two things happened. He, 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 was, he was signed up to Conan the Barbarian, and it was supposed to start shooting in something like 79 or something. They delayed and delayed and delayed until shooting 
wasn't going to start till late 1980. So he'd streamlined his physique, but to get to, to, to be Conan, he started training again, started putting on size. But he kind of like educated the public, like, I'm so active, I still got this fatigue, I'm doing a Conan movie, but you have to have an audio. And his audio was fitness, it was a small move he made. So I learned from that, because in the point of view, you want to stay in the game being active, you don't want to lose your fan. But he was also very irked by people like Mike Menser, who sort of debunked Arnold's training theories. Arnold was a volume guy, trained six times a week, twice a day, 20 sets of body part. Menser was train four or five times a week, three sets of body part, you know, high intensity. And sort of, it really knocked, as a word we use in English, Arnold. He wanted to teach these guys a lesson, you know. So even Zane said to him, who he was very friendly with, you know, um, you're making a comeback, aren't you? You're putting so much into it. This is from, no, no, he, every, he told everybody, no, I'm, I'm going to, Australia do commentary for CBS, you know, I'm not going to do it. But uh, what happened is I had an accident where I fell into my swimming pool and, and basically severed my urethra, smashed my urethra and had internal bleed. You know, it was awful. I almost died. Went into shock. But I ended up going in a contest anyway. It was an error in judgment. I was encouraged by Arnold to go in. That was his ploy was to get me. But basically, I think he was getting even for the year before. 79 when I won the Olympia then, he, I embarrassed him apparently. He asked me, he said, I was coming off stage, uh, coming up, you know, off stage with the trophy. He says, Frank, what's it like to win Olympia this year? I says, Arnold, it's even better than when I beat you for, Olymp for Mr. Universe. And that really, they aired that and that really made him angry. And Arnold said to him, Frank, it's not about friendship, it's about strategy. He didn't want Frank to get the extra incentives to, oh, you know, I better put the pedal down on this. So he went to Australia, and everybody thinks he's there to do commentary. And then the night before the contest, he enters. And of course, that sent shudders through the bodybuilding world at the time. He went to the competitors' meeting, and um, this riled a few people up. You know, he. he Sammy Binu said something, and, and Arnold argued with him. And uh, the comment was made uh, about Menser said something, and Arnold said something about Menser's waist hanging out last year, and that's why he didn't win, because his waist is hanging out all the time. And at that, Menser attacked him. He jumped Arnold. And uh, some people pulled him off. Bill Pearl was one of them. And that was it. You know, this was uh, hotheads going at it. Well, it's interesting, Arnold came back and was in his best shape. But, like I said before, like Joe said, go back to your roots, because Arnold was used bodybuilding because he had the fitness world to back him up. And that was a good point, because I think if he came second and third, it really didn't matter, because he was already five times at Olympia, or sixth time, so he had a name. And most people, to this day, say he shouldn't have won the contest. I never heard Mike Mincer say he should have ever won the contest. I think the general consensus of everybody there was the fact that the end result was not acceptable, not only to the bodybuilders there, but to the audience as well. But of course, the controversy of that contest was absolutely enormous. CBS went to Sydney with a full film crew and they filmed the whole thing. Immediately after the contest was over with, the, the guy that was the director was a guy by the name of Sherman Egan. And he called up, he said, I'd like to meet with you and Zane and Mincer. So we went to a meeting. He says, look, guys, he says, this Mr. Olympia contest can never be shown on television. He says, it's so obvious, even from the eyes of a non-professional, that the right person didn't win. We could never put this on television. So they still had a contract for 1981, and they paid the money because they were obligated, but they never even sent a film crew to cover it. And that's the last time the major networks have ever covered bodybuilding. I wish I wouldn't gone in that year and went in the next year when Colombo went it. You know, that was a travesty. Come on, give it to anybody, huh? I mean, that could have been incredible that year. But I, I passed the following year for political reasons. We're already, everybody was mad at each other, so you know, we didn't go back to compete that year in the Olympia. The 1980 Mr. Olympia left a lot of people very bitter. And 
for maybe some egotistical reason, we decided that we were not going to enter the 1981 Mr. Olympia. And Franco, who was always two steps behind Arnold, makes his comeback from a, a leg injury a few years before when in the world's strongest man they dropped a refrigerator on his leg and broke it. And he won that contest. Now, to most people, that was a bigger controversy than Arnold. You can see why Arnold could have won, but not many people can see why Renko was the winner. Once again, Chris Dickerson had to settle for second place. I said, what happened in Sydney could never happen in the United States. Well, I was totally wrong because the same thing happened again in 81. But people only choose to remember 1980. You'd have to go back and really, because I didn't go to the contest, I kept my word, but you'd have to ask people like Danny Padilla, Chris Dickerson, uh, Roy Callender, Tom Platts, how they felt about it because they must have really been discouraged after repeating the same thing the year before. The dust gradually settled. 1982 saw Chris Dickerson become the first African-American to win the Mr. Olympia after more than a decade of competing. The following year, Samir Banu, the Lion of Lebanon, claimed his Mr. Olympia victory. 1983 in Munich, Samir Banu always got tremendous shape, massive arms, great back, but always held water. In 82, in my opinion, he was fourth. He could have won because he'd, he'd, he'd got rid of the water. He'd, he'd, he'd learned how to get the water out of his system. I mean, at the very least, uh, I felt that the show was between me and Chris Dickerson. 82, I went to London bigger than ever for the Olympian Dickerson one. I was a little bit too big, maybe. My, my feeling is first or second would have been much fairer than coming in fourth. So, yeah, I made up my mind... Uh, that uh, since I peaked properly for the 82, I decided to go to Germany uh, for the 1983. Miss Olympia was held in Munich. I left early, six weeks prior to the show. I did my homework. I even was more focused because I want this thing so bad, you know. So here I'm preparing for the first go round, man, and uh, I peaked at 243 pounds. I entered the show at 233 pounds, the same weight I won the uh, the uh, IFBB World Championship. So what happened to the 10 pounds? What happened? Yeah, I put myself through, uh, you know, a tough, tough preparation and uh, good enough. We managed to win it. We, we got it done. He came out and he had a Christmas tree back that like nobody had ever seen before, massive arms, uh, and he, he won the contest. I went into that show, I placed third. You know, Samir won it that year. And I think Muhammad Makawi took second. I took third, Frank Zane took fourth. And already I could see the tide turning, you know, as Lee Haney, place, Lee Haney placing third ahead of me and Samir winning it, you know. I figured, well, this is it. I gotta retire sometime, you know, now, now is it. I'm in great shape, I'm going out looking my best. So that was, that was the last show. I think. Being Mr. Olympia for Sammy, he had to travel a lot, a lot of, he, he, he didn't, he wasn't as prepared for 1984 as, uh, as he was the previous year. And I don't think anybody was prepared for Lee Haney. Lee Haney came along with a combination of, of size uh, and good aesthetics. There was nothing blocky about, uh, about Lee, he had a great shape. Uh, and part of that, by the way, is because I always describe him as a guy with mastodon muscles but not mastodon bones. Haney got into bodybuilding because he broke his leg twice playing high school football. That is, he had this massive uh, muscle structure, but his, his bones were, and joints were smaller. That's how come he got the, the, uh, uh, the taper. Because I knew when I peaked at 243, with symmetry, balance, with the look of Robbie, with the look of Arnold, and a posing routine uh, like a Frank Zane, but you know, with the, the movement of Frank Zane or, or Ed Corny then, that was a winning combination. So that's what I worked upon achieving in 1984. And as I prepared for that competition, I prepared like, like never before. Lee Haney took notice to me because he saw that I trained so hard. And Lee Haney came up to me, he goes, hey, you know, I'm getting ready to go into the Olympia. Would you like to train with me? He was the most intense guy that I've ever trained with. I mean, intense in every sense of the word. 
you know, Rich would leave it all in the gym when he trained. I mean, foaming at the mouth, drooling the whole nine yard. That's how Rich was. And then what was even better is then I went with Lee Haney to New York for his first Mr. Olympia win, and he won that show. And it was just it was it was just one of the greatest experiences. I turned pro, and my good friend ended up winning Mr. Olympia. All of that came together at that 1984 Mr. Olympia. When they raised my arms in victory, man, I I felt I was on top of the world then. And I I knelt down on stage and I thank God for what he had done and what he, has, what he had allowed me to do. You know, I'm this 20 year old, 21 year old cocky kid uh, thinking, man, I could go right into the Mr. Olympia, um, you know, and win the show. And I still knew there was Lee Haney, this, you know, this Lee Haney who's just at that time was a freak, real wide clavicle, little waist, you know, huge back, thick chest. Rich Gaspari, he, he, he was responsible for a certain evolution of bodybuilding until he came along as a pro, made his pro debut in, in 85, his Olympia debut in 85 and got third. He was 22 years old. And now I'm this kid, you know, 22 years old, coming in in third place and, and I was like a bit disappointed and people are like, what are you crazy? You're 22 years old, you're first Mr. Olympia, you come in third place in that show. So I was like, wow, this is easy. I'm just gonna do it again and I'm gonna win the next year. And it just never came out that way. <laughs> Nobody ever seen that hardness of vascularity and the rip glutes. This was a new thing. I brought something different to the sport that no one else had at that time, and that was striated glutes. I was known for my, my butt, <laughs> for being the hardest, you know, hardest bodybuilder at that time. So I set this standard in the sport, and then going into the Mr. Olympia, I became one of the favorites now. It's amazing. Um, each year brought about something different or another different turn in my life because, as you know, I was the father as I trained for the Mr. Olympia competitions. And then there was all talk in the magazines that Rich is favorite to win, Rich can beat Lee Haney. And in my mind at that time, it's like, you know what? Maybe I can beat Lee Haney. Even though he was like this guy, my great bodybuilder now. Mind you, just to, just to remember, we were living in California together. Now we both moved, I moved back to New Jersey. He moved to Atlanta. We still communicated and talked, we were friends, but I was very competitive. And as a friend, I still wanted to beat him. I've always looked at my training for a Mr. Olympia competition, even as the NPC Nationals competition, is my job. I'm going to work. And when I'm at work, give my very best. Don't have slack on anything, because I've been taught that, to work as though I'm working unto God. And if you're working for the master, then you're going to give your all every time around. And I wanted to make a year, year's worth of gains, because I figured if I didn't compete, that I was going to get better and go into the 1987 Olympia and win. And that ended up not being true uh, until 1988. I come in second again, probably the best condition that I could be in. But again, it wasn't enough to beat uh, Lee Haney. But then there was another bodybuilder, and it was uh, Lee Labrada. Uh, he was known for his, you know, symmetry and structure, and you know, the mass with class. You know, entering the pro ranks at 175 pounds can be a, a daunting challenge for anybody. Lee Labrada came along at the same time, and there was certain aspect. Lee had great proportions, could present himself well, very polished, big arms for a little guy. You know, uh, in, in 89, I mounted a serious challenge to Haney for the first time, uh, you know, I, I, but I came in a solid second. And uh, I was a crowd favorite because we were competing in Rimini, Italy at the time. And of course, the Italians have an eye for uh, aesthetic physiques, you know, uh, with the Roman heritage and that type of thing. So I was very popular there. And you had Sonny Smith, uh, Vince Taylor, a lot of great champions, Lita Brada. I think uh, Rich, Rich, I called him Rich the Itch, he never would go away. Coming from second and now dropping to second and then losing a losing to Lee Labrada and Vince Taylor. Uh, and Lee Haney again won the show. And I geared up for 1990 and I thought that was gonna be my year because that was the year that they had the drug testing. And, and, uh, and I knew that, uh, that with you know, my natural genetics and the like that I would be able to put on a very strong showing. And, uh, and I gotta tell you that what was running through my mind as uh, came down to the wire and uh, the announcer said, and the winner is Lee, because we're both Lees. Um, it was the it was like a feeling of being like at the edge of a cliff, and I got to tell you that I, I was either going to jump off and soar, 
or I was going to fall to the bottom and crash. And, uh, and it, was, it was the feeling of a free fall when Haney's name was called for uh, first place. But again, it was the size factor that Haney had. It, it was like, well, you can beat me on that, but take that, you know, and, and it, it went like that. And Labrada came very close to toppling Haney, you know, in, in Rimini in Italy and in 1990, which was the drug tested contest. Um, but it was not to be, you know, and, and again, Lee Labrada would have been a magnificent Mr. Olympia in, in personality and bearing. I was very young as a bodybuilder and I started seeing things happen to me. I started getting injuries and actually almost going into like a burnout, you know, with, uh, with competing. Going into then the 1990 Mr. Olympia, uh, Mr. Olympia, I ended up getting fifth place in that show. So I dropped another place and I was like, oh my God, I'm done, <laughs> you know, in bodybuilding. You've you got to feel sorry for Rich because if Lee Haney had never existed, he'd have been a, at least a three-time Mr. Olympia because he was second three times in a row. At a phenomenally, uh, you know, most pros today, well, they're not turning pro until the 30, and he was doing this at 22, 23, 24, you know. And, you know, he was another magnificent guy. I talked to Cheryl, I said, baby, you know, I've done, my wife, I said, I've done seven Olympias in a row. No one has ever done seven in a row. And I said to her, well, what do you think about that being, you know, it? Being a competitor, Shirley is. She looked at me and said, it. What do you mean, it? She said, you got to do A. What are you talking about? Let's don't even have this conversation anymore. That's my wife. And so that gave me enough zeal and fire to go on to do that eighth Olympia. But uh, along came a guy who was equal in size and poundage and had good shape. Everybody decries Dorian Yates' shape, but he's got the shape. He's got the proportions. You know, there's no long torso or short legs or he's got the back and everything. And Lee Haney knew he was a threat. And if you're looking to knock out a titan, you got to have a guy, at least at least in my mind, you got to have another titan. And they, they, they went at it in um, Orlando in 91. The symmetry round, Lee Haney won. The muscularity round, Dorian won. I think, I don't know if it's the first time, I haven't seen it since, where there's just a two-man pose down. It was Dorian Yates and Lee Haney, and it was the first guy to go on stage to have the stature and the body weight to stand next to, to Lee Haney. And um, I enjoyed being the underdog. And the crowd was going nuts, these two big guys. Nobody had seen 245, 250 pound guys, two of them going at it in condition, you know. And uh, it took four and a half minutes, because I timed it, for them to do the, the then seven compulsory poses, and they gave everything, you know. You couldn't be beat. That was my mindset. That's what I worked on my entire career. And it all came together when I chose the music Excalibur. That was the return of the king. In 1984, his first Mr. Olympia, he posed the theme from Excalibur. And so the certain symmetry took place because his last contest he posed to Excalibur again. Gave this magnificent performance and of course won the posing round. So I went into that competition in perfect peace. At the end of the night, my arms were raised in victory. And he took home the eighth Sandow and that was the end of his competitive days. And Lee Haney, I think if you had to say, who was the first gentleman of bodybuilding? Who was the greatest ambassador we ever had and still have? It's Lee Haney. A new age of self-awareness had hit the bodybuilding industry at the turn of the 1990s. Industry leaders sought a presence at the Olympic Games. The innocence of years gone by started to erode as athletes began submitting themselves to drug tests. Well, I think the feeling was that there needed to be drug testing because, um, you know, the, there was a hope Ben Weeder wanted to get bodybuilding into the Olympics, so we had to sort of approach IOC standards in drug testing. Uh, we all got notified that they were going to be instituting a drug test um, in, I believe, like October. So that was introduced for the first time at the 1990 Arnold Classic. I won the Arnold Classic Championships, and a week later I wound up in Columbus, Ohio, and I won the competition with perfect scores. $60,000, Mike uh, Ashley had gotten second place there, Mike Christian was third, and I went on uh, a tour of Canada, and while I was there, I got a call from Wayne D'Amelio a week later that my drug test had came back positive, and I have an opportunity to ch check sample B, 
in either in Westwood, uh, Los Angeles, or in Chicago. However, I was on tour, and I, I couldn't do anything about it. NBC filmed it. They had to re-edit it. They were showing it at a later date. Mike Ashley was the winner. Very clunky. So my next call was obviously to Joe Weider, like, what do I do here? I mean, uh, this is a time when they didn't have the Internet. They didn't have Twitter. They didn't have Facebook. They didn't have cell phones where you could text message stuff. So there's 4,000 people that were in Columbus, Ohio, that wouldn't be notified of this information for nearly three months. And uh, Joe Weider had just said, basically, Sean, you know, uh, stay on your game. Do what you have to do. You're one of our you know, most highly decorated athletes. We are going to support you and uh, prove them wrong in Chicago in, in, in 1990. So it was about eight months I had between losing 60,000 and watching the Arnold Classic Championship go right through my hands um, to trying to get redemption in Chicago. So the 1990 Mr. Olympia was going to be drug tested. So they decided to test all the guys before so you'd know who'd failed on Friday so we wouldn't have the embarrassment of taking the trophy off somebody. Was I baffled by the test results? Uh, of course I was. I didn't think uh, I would test positive because, uh, you know, based on the athletes talking amongst each other, um, certain drugs work certain ways and they're faster acting and they're, you know, um, in and out of your system. And, of course, uh, none of us knew how to pass a test. Um, and that was never my goal either. But, of course, uh, I didn't argue it. I didn't try to fight it. I just wanted, went back to the gym. I went back to the gym. But I knew I had to work even harder uh, because I had eight months and I had a legend I was going up against in Chicago uh, in the form of Lee Haney. So Friday night, out came the results. And favorites like Momo Benazir and Barry DeMay had failed. And Van Walcott Smith and Vince Comerf had failed. So two of the top names were out of the Olympia, you know. Come the day of the contest, Saturday afternoon, all the guys that were left in walked out and it was immediately obvious that all of them were down in size. Lee Haney, Sean, I've always told Sean this, the legs were still there, but the upper body just didn't have that density. There was a, three guys who looked the same as they always did. That was Mike Christian, Francis Ben Fatto, and Frank Hillebrand. Everybody else was down a bit. Lee Labrada, Gaspari, all of them were down. But then another thing happened. Vince McMahon launched his World Bodybuilding Federation he said he was going to just do a magazine, and he had a booth at the Olympia. But at the conclusion of this Olympia, his guys, Tom Platts and others, went round handing out, announcing the new federation, the WBF, the World Bodybuilding Federation. When he was doing very well with professional wrestling and decided he would try his hand at bodybuilding. It sent earthquakes through the whole bodybuilding landscape. Everybody thought, McMahon, with all his money and everything, this is going to happen. And suddenly we knew who was in there, you know, the likes of Stride and DeMay, Quinn, Mike Chris, really big hitters that were top six finishes in the Olympia every time they were in it, Mike Quinn was there. Vince McMahon had just entered into bodybuilding and was coming along with the WBF, a new federation, um, offering more money and he secured like, you know, 13 bodybuilders away from the IFBB, which made some body things a little bit easier for some bodybuilders that were in the IFBB because he took a few good guys. The amount of money they were offered was enormous. I think Barry was getting 300000 a year. This is back in 1990. And even somebody like Lee Haney's contract with Weeder would probably be 40 or 50 grand at that time. So it was enormous. But Barry said, you know, and this goes back to what I said before, the drive is always to be the best in the world. He said, we all realized we weren't going to be the best in the world. We were going to be the best in this little group. We weren't going to beat Lee Haney. And somehow the drive went out of it, you know, and some of the guys were far from the best. I think what knocked the legs out from Vince McMahon was the, the scandal he had with the steroids. And I think he decided that, you know, bodybuilding with its, you know, the slur of drugs, it, it had been an experiment that he'd gone into with a good heart, uh, but it was time to be strategic and you know, concentrate on, on what he knew best. And um, that was the end of the WBF. Had he had some good management, I mean, what makes you extremely professional, that formula that works so well in wrestling ain't going to work in bodybuilding. And he applied that same formula, and it didn't work. If he would have just listened to some people, he wouldn't have wasted money, 
and he could have made a big dent. It, it might have been different, but he was the one that forced Job to start offering contracts because then eventually he became afraid he would lose everybody. He did call up the, the Ben and Joe Weeder after it folded and said, you know, I'm done, you know, you guys are, know what you're doing more than I do in this sphere and good luck and no hard feelings. So, you know, there was no rancor in the end. Uh. While the industry dealt with its various troubles, the competitive standard set by Lee Haney was about to be shattered by the new juggernaut of the 90s, Dorian Yates. And then along came Dorian Yates from England who won the Mr. Olympia six times and just brought a whole new standard of hardness and freakiness and, uh, you know, to me, the golden age of bodybuilding was the 90s, you know. Um, I think after that, you know, Yates is often blamed for taking the sport in the wrong direction. But what he was doing was doing what he knew he had to do to win. And hardness and mass became, seemed to be the criteria, the calling cards. You know, so you had the, uh, you know, the uh, more symmetrical uh, and classical type physiques like Sean Ray, uh, Lee Labrada, uh, you had um, uh, Barry DeMay, you know, you had a number of guys that were threatening that standard, okay, but that was squelched. Again, we were at a crossroads and the crossroads went the other way. Again, back to the past, to, to the large bodybuilder and the, and the incarnation of Dorian Yates this time. And it has never looked back. You know what? If I can get past Labrada, Haney doesn't have much longer to go. I could potentially become Mr. Olympia. And it became very real to me in 1990 getting third uh, in that Olympia that I would one day become Mr. Olympia because there's no way Lee Haney can last that much longer. Um, Unfortunately for me, I didn't see the shadow coming. Um, Dorian Yates by way of England. When I turned pro, I don't think I was seriously thinking about being Mr. Olympia. I just wanted to be a good pro, and that's as far as I was, my thinking was going at, at that time. Um, so I was the first European bodybuilder to win Mr. Olympia and also training at the time in Europe. Dorian Yates was able to dominate bodybuilding in the 90s because he was big, bigger and thicker than anybody else. Plus, he was aesthetic, as I, as I say. Uh, he was Herculean, not Apollonian. So he didn't have a pretty, shapely uh, physique, but it was balanced and artistic and sculptural. The evolution of bodybuilding changed when Dorian came into the scene, because he was one of the first bodybuilders to compete at like 260, 265. So he set this like freakiness to the sport. Well, in 1992, of course, uh, Dorian Yates won his first Mr. Olympia in Helsinki, Finland. Mr. Olympia was wide open that year. Um, I'll never forget it. It was wide open in 1992. Ferrigno was coming back, and he was, he was, you know, competing over 300 pounds. Part of me said, what am I doing here? I'm standing here competing. Am I out of my mind? I'm 42 years old. These guys like Sean Ray, these guys like, you know, Milo Savage and everything. They're like in their 20s. But then I realized that I got a lot of work to do because after coming back for 17 years, you need a couple of years training under your belt. And I got a lot to learn because the hardest thing for me was the posing. All you guys were standing there with the app tent and relaxed. I was basically just standing like in the 70s, kind of like semi relaxed. And people kept yelling, the audience, pose, pose, tent. And it was very foreign to me, but I knew I had a lot of work to do. To be honest, it was a little bit hard for me that, that year because I didn't have any one person to focus on. I got to beat this guy. You know, there was a whole bunch of guys that could have possibly won the title so it was a little bit hard and also it's a it's a barrier to get over could it really be me could I be the best in the world at my chosen sport uh, there was that barrier and then eventually I got over that like why the hell not you know it's got to be somebody and I don't think anyone's training harder than me and I always had that inside of me like I don't think anyone could have done anymore so that gives you a lot of strength they called me second and it was a relief it was a joyful moment it was a celebration for me because at that point I knew um, that I, I had obviously probably earned a spot to be there um, never really questioned myself if I should be there or not but I knew at that point I have a responsibility to do now is to move forward and, 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 and to be better I went on to have to watch um the, the big side, phrases like gargantuan and, and mass monsters come, was being ushered in. Paul Dillette came onto the scene. Akam Albrecht was coming into the, the fray. Uh, Jean-Pierre Fuchs. 
all these big six foot bodybuilders were coming in, making a big impact on the industry. And, and this is where I think bodybuilding started to change. 93 was a great year where I made a leap forward um, in physique development and body weight on stage. Nobody had seen before. That was great. Dorian Yates showed up in 93, a transformed bodybuilder that was unbeatable. Dorian was taking bodybuilding to a whole new level of you know, impression. I mean, people were just getting overwhelmed with this size. I was the first guy to compete at the Mr. Olympia, uh, I think, in condition over 250 pounds. But I had this drive and I had this system of high intensity heavy training, which had gotten me from a backstreet basement gym in Birmingham in England to be Mr. Olympia. So it's, you know, once your foot's on the pedal, on the gas, it's a little bit hard to take it off. 1994 came along and I got, I got first runner up um, in the Mr. Olympia Championships, my first time in that position and, and this is when Dorian tore his bicep and came in a little bit heavy and, and bloated around the midsection. I was very stubborn. I wanted to train as, you know, all year round, just as heavy as I did in the off season coming up for a contest, which was not the best idea. Uh, <clears throat> I think I was doing bent over rows with like 440 or something like that, six weeks out from the contest and there was a bang and a sharp pain in my left bicep. Um, so obviously there was a, you know, it was a serious injury, there was damage there. I think a lot of people, um, you know, you could flip a coin on who you talk to and, and what they liked, had me winning that contest. Whereas Dorian felt in certain poses, he won enough poses to win the competition. I, I can't take that away from him because clearly he was bigger. Um, clearly he was more dominant, more imposing figure. I mean, he brought all that stuff. 97, he had a, a quad injury early on in the year and, and then another one and then three weeks before the contest. I had some advice, um, which probably now is not good advice. I had a cortisone injection in that tendon, which of course takes the inflammation away, but also weakens the tendon. Um, and I did ease up a little bit on the training. And uh, three weeks out, I was doing a tricep exercise, not particularly heavy, and bang. There was a really intense, sharp pain and a noise, and I knew it, it was a serious injury. I was out in the garden, the phone rang, it, it, it's six o'clock in, in Santa Monica, it's two o'clock in England. And my wife Anne says, Dorian's on the phone, at two o'clock in the morning. Well, well, this isn't good. Again, it was difficult and psychologically it's very hard going into a contest when you're not going in all guns blazing. Um, but I managed to pull off that win. He still wanted to get it repaired and come back the next year, but in the end he, he got it repaired, it never came back, he couldn't handle the weights. I couldn't train 100%, so that was, that, for me, that was a message. You want to compete the best in the world, you can't do that unless you're training 100%. So um, that was a time for me to retire. It wasn't something that I prepared for or considered. It was something that was more or less forced upon me, but, you know, maybe it's a good thing. And he pushed his body to the point where he tore it apart over several years. At the end of his career, he just it had all kinds of, of damage to his body uh, because you cannot push yourself that hard. Uh, and not have the body give way. But in the meantime, he was able to get a level of development and a thickness and a hardness that the other guys couldn't get. And, you know, that, that was his reign over. You know, he'd, he'd won six. I, I gotta say the 90s is probably the most competitive period in bodybuilding as far as the depth of uh, quality of physique and, and talent that were there. You got six or seven guys there that are very, very close competitively that could interchange at any point depending on what condition the, the guys came in. Um, so I would say definitely that was the most intense period. So whether I won three, four, five, six Mr. Olympias, it would still be a great achievement with the people I were competing against. When Yates gracefully retired in 1997, the torch was passed to another born champion who changed bodybuilding for good, Ronnie Coleman. Day I go to the gym, and uh, Brian Dawson is the owner. He's like, man, he see me come in. He's like, man, you, you uh, compete? I'm like, no. <laughs> Say, you ever competed? I'm like, no. Like, you're pretty big. You, you probably need to compete. You could probably be world champion one day. And as soon as he said that, first thing out of my mouth was, no, thank you. Now I'm not into bodybuilding. I don't. I haven't even picked up a bodybuilding magazine. I don't know nothing about what's going on in that sport. I'm very unconcerned, it's just like some foreign to me. No, no, I, I, you know, I, you, you've been asking me that every day I come in, I, every day I, I come in here, and I, every day I tell you no, so I, I'm still gonna have to, you know, decline the offer. He's like, 
Yeah, I'm, I'm, really, I'm telling you, you, you need to do this. He's like, I tell you what. He said, uh, there's a contest coming up in about three, four months. He's like, uh, if you compete in this show, I give you a free membership to the gym. And remember, I'm struggling, so <laughs> anytime somebody offers you something free at a time like that, you're like, okay, what, what I got to do? <laughs> Nobody's had a slower climb up the ladder, you know. Made his pro debut in 92 at the Olympia, didn't finish in the top 15, was a journeyman pro, in and out, in and out. And I can remember it like it was yesterday, because I, I remember I was backstage pumping up, and I look over, and it's Sean Ray's over there. <laughs> <laughs> He's doing push-ups on the wall, and the first thing I see is this big old chest uh, sticking out while all these striations and stuff are going. I'm like, man, I'm in the wrong sport. <laughs> I played dead last in that show. 98 became his breakthrough year in a big way. At the end of 97, there were seven Grand Prix in Europe, and Kevin LeVrone won the first six. And then, sensationally, Ronnie won, beat Kevin. Kevin was a fantastic bodybuilder. He won that last one, and that was a sign, you know, because then in 98, he won the San Francisco show, or him and Lavroni went in three shows in May, New York, San Francisco, and in Canada, Montreal or something, and Ronnie won two, Lavroni won one. Four or five months after that, in September, and I was faced with, at that point, uh, the Olympia was wide open. And Plex was the favorite, but even then, you know, you can see Flex's back double biceps is, is a thing of beauty. But the only guy in that lineup of that time, Lavroni, Sean, um, NASA, that could match him on double biceps, not beat him, but not be vanquished by him, was Ronnie. So we come down to Mr. Olympia, I'm like, man, if I can make the top three, this will be more, b better than a dream come true. You know, because I know I never win. Because, like I said, I just got in the sport just to keep my free membership to the gym. The Olympia was what I wanted in 1998 because Dorian Yates had retired. He'd gotten injured. I'd sat behind him for six years. Uh, I'd watch, watched the tail end of the Lee Haney era. And lo and behold, me, Kevin, and Flex um, see Ronnie Coleman, a guy that we used to not even pay attention to, leapfrog over all of us. So come the day of the show in New York, 1998, Mr. Olympia, Madison Square Garden, great crowd. They walk out. And Ronnie is ripped to shreds. He's as hard. He's, he's maybe a bit down in fullness, but he's as hard as a rock. In fact, he looked almost grey to me, and at one point I thought, he's going to pass out. He was right on the edge. Flex was just a little bit off. Still, Flex took the prejudging, but Ronnie came back in the evening and took the title. You know, they had all, they, leading up to the show, everybody already gave it to Flex, so I'm like, OK, at least I got a second, so I'm still just as happy as I can ever be. <laughs> so. All of a sudden, Wayne calls out uh, Flex Wheeler name for second. I'm like, did I just hear that right? And I'm like, yeah. And the first thing I did was collapse. Ronnie became from this quiet, slow burn guy in the background who nobody ever thought of being a threat to anything. He loved being Mr. Olympia. And 1999, he came back, maybe not as hard as 98, but fuller. And, and he was like a walk in an anatomy chart, you know. And uh, he just dominated on size. You know, he just got bigger and bigger. My, my heavy was with, with uh, 04 when I was 296 on the, on the Olympia stage. I saw the writing on the wall with Ronnie Coleman coming in at 280, 275, 290 pounds. The bodybuilding and the landscape was forever changed. The size just blew everybody away, you know. Um, Jay Cutler was, was in it, but there was no contest that time. You know, Ronnie was just an amalgam of muscle that, uh, you know, a freak of nature that, you know, we, we, we won't see for a long time. Ronnie Coleman reigned supreme until 2005, tying Lee Haney's eight Mr. Olympia wins. Coleman even won four Mr. Olympia contests over the man who would, in time, come to eclipse him, Jay Cutler. You know, I always wanted to be somebody. I picked up a magazine when I was 12 years old. I saw a picture of Chris Dickerson. And my sister's boyfriend, he had some old magazines laying around, and I was just overwhelmed by what the body could look like. I couldn't believe it. You know, I had seen superheroes before, you know, in Batman and Superman in cartoons, but I never saw in real life a physique look like that, and I just, you know, I marveled at it. I just couldn't believe that this was actually attainable. So here I am from small town USA, 
my dream is to always go to California and train amongst you know the pros I read about in the magazines but it can be possible because these other guys did it. In 2001 Jay Cutler nearly beat Ronnie but after that Ronnie you know reeled off another few victories. I knew then that I had something that I could battle Ronnie with and that was really what drove me into 2001 where um, I was a much better athlete coming into Mr. Olympia. I took the whole year to prepare. Now I have the fans behind me because now I was an underdog and I was happy. I was ecstatic to be second place. I, that was almost as great as winning to me because I was really competitive and a lot of people thought Jay should win this competition. So Jay was always finishing second apart from 2002 when he didn't compete in the Olympia. In 2005, it was very, very close. Personally, I would have given it to Jay. And Jay was absolutely devastated by it. So I felt in 2005, um, I matched Ronnie Coleman like in a lot of poses, including some back shots, which I never thought I did. I improved a little bit there. Um, and he still was definitely at a different level. But in 2006, he finally beat Ronnie. When we were building up for the competition, you know, of course, it was became a Ronnie and Jay show after all these years, of, after being second, you know, four times in a row. Of course, it's, you know, I was, it was almost like Ronnie Coleman, Jay Cutler, Mr. Olympia. So when I won and knocked off the champ, which he was going for his record ninth, Mr. Olympia, he had already won eight. It was a, a huge, huge uh, the monkey off my back. And of course, after that, Jay won in 2007, and some people thought Martinez had, had won, and then uh, Jay lost in 2008 to Dexter, and it seemed that Jay, Jay, it was over for Jay. Going back and looking at Jay from the previous years, you know, each year he was getting, you know, he wasn't getting much better than he was the previous year, so he was getting worse and worse. I say, well, you know, I think I can beat Jay. You know, so my trainer at the time, Joe McNeil and I, we put our heads together, came up with a game plan, man, and we went into the Olympia, um, you know, full steam ahead. I, 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 I just knew I could beat him that show. I knew it wasn't going to be on because he's trying to play. You know, after me winning the Arnold and all that stuff, I was, it was, it was the battle between me and Jay. So I knew he was going to try and play my game. So that's how I beat him in the GNC show of strength because he tried to play my game and tried to get shredded and come down and he lost a lot of weight and tried to get just as hard as me. And that's how they would beat him there. Well, I knew he was going to do the same thing for the Arnold in 2000, I mean, Olympia in 2008, which he did. And um, I was able to pull it off. And Dexter did win it deservedly. Dexter, um, you know, was shredded, had great shape and fullness, had got all the body parts, you know. Jay was a bit off, so it, it was Dexter's, Dexter's year and he won deservedly. But when I won Mr. Olympia, I, I can't really put in words how I was feeling because it took me six months to even acknowledge that I'm Mr. Olympia now. I mean, that really took me that long. You know, people would come up to me and they would be like, how are you Mr. Olympia? It's like, man, I'm Dexter, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so it took forever for me to accept that name and that title. So to actually win and be on stage and just everything came out, every all the dreams and that everything that you can imagine that you went through in life, you know, all the sleeping on the floors and, and all that stuff I put my family through, all that stuff came out on stage that day, man, to win that title. So it was like, I won this title. That's what I sacrificed, you know, to get here. And then he reinvented himself in 2009. When he walked out, it was like, wow. I can't really fear any of that. And I can't fear losing because I've already lost the title and won it back. And I was the first guy to do that. And, uh, you know, I'm only thinking victory. And he just rewrote the re record books with that, that type of physique and then took it again in 2010. Never really been a goal to be that all-time winner. I never thought one was attainable. Now I got two, three, four. Jay, I have tremendous respect for Jay, you know, on so many levels. He's like a great bodybuilder. Um, I don't think I've shot anyone that wide as uh, Jay. I mean, you know, he was a uh, true uh, freak of his time. This is what established, you know, Jay Cutler. This is who I am. And I fell in love with this iron game for so, you know, so many years ago when I mentioned I was 12 years old. And now look what I've achieved.
I become the best in the world or something. That's everyone's dream. With the transition into another decade, one massive king gives way to another. One whose talents have a decidedly gifted future for bodybuilding. You know, although I didn't have as many struggles in the amateur ranks, I definitely felt that, you know, I had to learn quite a bit being a professional because I wasn't being embraced by all the other guys because they're saying, well, who this punk kid? He only competed for two years and he's pro and he's on the magazines. He's got sponsorships. You know, it just taught me that the only way I was going to earn the respect and the love was to compete at a high level. And that's just what I did. And I made sure of that. You know, I was very confident because I just knew in my heart that I, I'm going to shock the world. You know, you should, I just remember Jay shaking my hand and just saying, you're the king now. And when he said that, I just realized, you know what? He's right. If I believe in it, he's right. If I don't believe in it, anything can happen. I could lose this thing next year. I truly feel that my type of physique is going to um, recharge the sport a little bit. I think my, my physique is still growing at the age of 31. So who knows how big I may get. But at the same time, I mean, I'm not stupid. I know that I know what got me the Mr. Olympia title. It wasn't trying to outmass anyone. It was it was about being um, more aesthetic, but yet having the muscles round, like car very cartoonish, and having sharp, sharp conditioning to make those muscles stand out even larger than life. I think after we watched Phil Heath win this Mr. Olympia in 2001, one thing is sure, um, bodybuilding is alive and well. You know, I look at Phil and I think about, I think about myself, I think about Sean Ray, I think about, you know, um, Flex Wheeler, I think about uh, size with class, mass. Sean used to say that all the time, you know, I think about Lee Labrada, I think about, you know, um, Gaspare, the cuts, you know, everything. He, he ties it all in together. I think today, where we are right now, you know, he's certainly a good champion um, for, for the sport. Fear brings a different type of flavor, uh, one that uh, sort of sort of sort of takes a little step back from the monstrous physique to more balanced size and symmetry, which that's where I'm from, so that's what I like. And I'm happy Phil Heath went one because to me he had the beautiful body, it's aesthetic. And I hate to see the sport go to get to a point that was sacrificing symmetry. In the course of just over a century, what was once a sideshow attraction had developed into a new way of life for millions around the world. Men who brought discipline, scientific expertise, and unrelenting dedication have inspired each successive generation to studiously build upon their achievements. Bodybuilding as a sport has as much to offer its competitors in return as they are willing to dedicate of themselves. Like the training regimes, business practices, and the athletes, bodybuilding will always be changing. It will never cease to evolve. A lot of sports have evolved. You know, we, we use the term evolution here. What I described before, going from Eugene Sandow to Yates and, and guys who came after, that, that was evolution. But evolution usually means, you know, a process of improvement. And I'm not sure, in, in many ways, I think the evolution of bodybuilding has peaked with the 90s. And we're not, we're not going forward with creating a, you know, the perfect human specimen. I think the guys now are generally bigger, but the, the conditioning is not as, as keen as it was in, in the 90s. Um, so, yes, the bodybuilders are bigger. Are they, are, are they better? Not necessarily, I don't think. You're talking about 18 almost consecutive wins, you know, almost two decades of champions, Olympian champions, that were freaks, you know? And it seemed that the fans liked the freaks. You know, they liked the, uh, you know, even to this very day, you know, the freaks sell, you know? Uh, Dorian sells, Ronnie sells, Jay sells. So over that 20 year period, could it have been different? Possibly, just think, Sean, if you won Mr. Olympia, or Kevin won Mr. Olympia, or Flex won Mr. Olympia, how things may have changed the tide. It's more of a freak factor nowadays. And I think the whole society is changing towards that. How photography is today, if you look in a, at any bodybuilding magazine, and it, it's a natural evolution with how the physiques looks today. It's all about shooting big, big, big weights, 
you know, huge muscles, using like wide angles just to enhance it. So I shoot differently. Before I could use like a long, like a telephoto lens, you know, to shoot everything. Because it makes everything in proportion, like the eye sees it, or a little bit more compressed maybe. And now you, you know, we use a lot of wide angle lenses used to make an arm look super big because that's what the latest fashion is somehow. The youngsters that are getting into this sport look at the magazines, they look at the bodybuilders that are uh, at the top now, and they realize that to get there, they're going to have to do things that they don't want to do. I look at where it is now, it is a little bit different from my eyes. You know, golly, man, I'd like to, I like a 63 Chevy. <laughs> you know, I got to send the four Corvette. I think I'm cool. But, you know, things change. I hear all the time people complaining that the bodybuilders are too big. And uh, I don't think they're too big at all. I think they're just heavyweights or super heavyweights. The problem is that the smaller bodybuilders uh, just don't get enough recognition because there aren't weight divisions in the pros. There are in the amateurs. Bodybuilding is not supposed to be about mass. It is supposed to be about sculptural perfection. And if you have a guy who's 5'9", uh, 225 pounds, absolutely perfect. Uh, he shouldn't be standing next to somebody who's um, uh, 295 pounds. Any more than the middleweight boxer should be forced to, to fight the heavyweight boxer. Weight divisions restore the aesthetic quality to bodybuilding. It's hard to say if we're heading in the right direction. It's just the evolution. It's going to get there anyway. I think the evolution of bodybuilding is along several lines. I think it's evolution in some sense. Over from the collisions and massive bombardment during the early days of the Earth. The rest comes from radioactive decay of heavy elements in the core. Heat escaping from the core creates convection currents in the next layer of the Earth, the mantle. The process is like a lava lamp, where heat from the bulb at the bottom creates convection currents in the oil, pushing the synthetic lava upward. The heat melts part of the mantle and sends plumes of magma, molten rock, rising to the surface. It rises between cracks in the plates, creating new rock that pushes the plates apart. I think that plate tectonics is virtually inescapable on this planet. It's an exceedingly efficient way to cool the interior of the Earth. This formation of new rock splits apart and separates the plates and the continents sitting on them. Today, the majority of this new rock forms under the sea, creating vast interconnected volcanic mountain ranges that extend through all the major oceans of the world. One range can clearly be seen at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean, along the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. It stretches more than 12,000 miles from the sub-Antarctic to the Arctic. It comes to the surface in a few places. Iceland was created from volcanic lava, bubbling up at the junction between the North American and Eurasian plates. It's one of the few places on Earth that one can actually see continents being pushed apart. We are watching here geological structures that you cannot really watch anywhere else. It's like a big textbook of geology. This is where the Earth's crust is being made. Paul Einarsson, professor of geophysics at the University of Iceland, monitors the mid-ocean ridge where the continental plates are splitting apart. The ridge in Iceland is almost three miles wide. On one side is the North American plate. On the other side, the Eurasian plate. The rift here grows as new rock forms at its center, pushing North America and Europe away from each other. The Atlantic Ocean widens and the two continents drift apart. Eventually, the Atlantic could become as big as the Pacific. To measure how fast they're splitting, Einarsson takes global positioning system readings at specific points along the plate margin. We put the antenna right on top of the point and then we can calculate the exact position of this point in the world with respect to the center of the Earth. Although the ridge appears calm and there's no magma rising to the surface, Einarsson's measurements 
show that the two continents are drifting apart by around an inch a year. So by the end of the century, Europe and America will be almost eight feet further apart. The movement in Iceland is typical of the processes shaping the continents since their birth 4.4 billion years ago. It's part of the great cycle of the Earth's continents. The new crust, created at the mid-ocean ridge, moves away, cools, and eventually sinks back into the Earth. When the first proto-continents formed, there were several interconnecting tectonic plates, constantly bumping and grinding against each other, pushing the new land over the planet. Today, the Earth has over a dozen plates, some colliding together, some moving apart. They are powerful enough to move a continent the size of North America over 3,000 miles in 200 million years. That's 15 miles every million years. The Earth, 3.4 billion years ago, and plate tectonics pushes the proto-continents together. They combine to form ever larger tracts of land. Scientists suggest that cratons combine with other cratons to form a supercontinent, a huge continuous stretch of land. It's called Valbara. Scientists are unsure of its exact shape or size, as only a few pieces, like the craton in South Africa, still remain. But Valbara's days are numbered. A rising plume of heat is growing beneath it. It's about to rip the world's first supercontinent into pieces. Two point seven billion years ago, Valbara, the world's first supercontinent, still dominates the planet. But plate tectonics, powered by heat from the Earth's core, is about to split it apart. Rock is a good insulator. When a continent gets very large, the rock traps heat beneath it. As it gets hotter and hotter, a plume of superheated magma builds up beneath the giant continental mass. The temperature continues to rise, and pressure in the mantle increases. Eventually, the crust can no longer contain the pressure, and the hot lava breaks through, ripping the land apart. You can see this process happening today in Africa. Heat from the Earth's core is ripping the continent apart. A giant rift valley runs from the Red Sea down to Mozambique. Giant cracks are opening up in the land. Volcanoes, like Kilimanjaro, mark spots where molten rock have risen to the surface in the past. In 10 million years, the eastern half of the continent will have split away. The molten lava trapped beneath the giant supercontinent of Valbara eventually smashes through the surface rock. The continent ruptures into several smaller pieces. These bits of land sail across the Earth. But nobody knows what happens to them or what the planet looks like at this time. The Earth is entering the Dark Ages. It is over two and a half billion years since it was formed. It will be over a billion years before another supercontinent forms. The Earth is entering a deadly cycle of destruction and rebirth. The theory of continental drift suggests that we go through cyclic phases of continental dispersion and then continental collision. And the continents then seem to move apart from one another and then collide with one another over a maybe a hundred million year or more time scale. When a large continent splits apart, the separate pieces travel away from each other, pushed by the creation of new land at the ridge between plates. Because the Earth has a constant surface area, the same amount of land created must be absorbed into the Earth. This process happens at subduction zones at the junctions of plates. At a subduction zone, crust dives down into the mantle to be melted to form new rock. 
when the plate subducts into the earth, it brings two pieces of land together. When they collide, a new supercontinent starts to form. It is now 1.1 billion years ago on our timeline, and the next known supercontinent has formed. Its name is Rodinia, and it holds almost all of the continental rock on the surface of the Earth. Still, no one knows exactly what it looked like, but at its heart is an area that will eventually become North America. 350 million years later, the cycle of annihilation and creation starts again as the buildup of heat beneath the surface of the Earth tears Rodinia apart. When Rodinia splits, it forms several smaller continents that for millions of years drift apart and then drift back together again to form Gondwana, a supercontinent in the southern hemisphere. Eventually, after several hundred million years, Gondwana slowly splits apart. Plate tectonics push the land back together to create the world's last supercontinent. It's a huge landmass known as Pangaea. All the continents we know today are here, joined together. Geologists are able to plot the continent's relative positions because 350 million years ago, there are numerous species on Earth, each living in distinct regions. This specimen that I have right here is the first trilobite that was ever described from what is now the United States. Um, it is exactly the same type of trilobite that occurs on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean in North Africa. So we know then that the uh, trilobites in the old and new worlds must have been close together because they're so closely related. The fossil records show that North America and Europe rest next to one another. The land where New York now sits is next to Morocco in North Africa. The Atlantic Ocean does not exist. The east coast of South America nestles against the western coast of Africa, while Australia, India, and Antarctica are joined to the southeast of Africa. If we want to look at a picture of the world 250 million years ago, we're gonna look at a world in which a four-footed creature could walk from one end of this landmass to the other. Pangaea is one giant continuous landmass. It not only makes the world look very different, it also has a dramatic effect on climate. Because much of the land is located far from the sea, the climate of the interior changes radically from season to season. It gets very hot in the summertime and extremely cold in the winter. You don't have the moderating influence of the ocean that we have today. So it's a very different world. And it's a world that um, in some ways is, is harsher and less hospitable, at least to life on land. It's thought that the climate change caused by Pangaea's formation may have played a role in one of the largest mass extinctions on Earth. This event, known as the Permo-Triassic mass extinction, wipes out about 90% of all life on Earth. It's been called the mother of all mass extinctions. I would consider that the formation of Pangaea, with its uh, uh, climate worsening effects, to be a contributing factor, however, and not the sole cause of the mass extinction. 250 million years ago, and the supercontinent of Pangaea is breaking up. The continents we know and recognize today begin to take shape. Over the next tens of millions of years, South America drifts away from Africa, North America away from Europe. Australia splits off from Antarctica and heads north to warmer climes. The positions of our continents are becoming familiar, although their distinguishable features are not. The world's vast mountain ranges, the Alps and Himalayas, and its great valleys, like the Grand Canyon, are yet to form. They will emerge out of one of the biggest battles in nature, the battle between colliding continents.
Earth 100 million years ago. The continental map of the modern world is gradually becoming recognizable. But a battle is still raging between the continents that will change the face of our world forever and create some of the most extraordinary geological features on the planet. As the continents move slowly across the Earth, crust and rock is dragged back down into the Earth at subduction zones between the tectonic plates. But when continents collide at the plate junctions, sometimes there is a battle for supremacy. If neither plate will submit and drop down to be consumed by the mantle, then both the continents slowly smash and grind into each other. These pinch points of continental collision build mountains. The Alps are the largest mountain range in Europe. Higher than the Rockies, the Alps stretch from France in the west, through Italy, Switzerland, and Austria, to Slovenia in the east. Their formation is a direct result of a continental collision between Africa and Europe. The story of the Alps begins when the African plate breaks away from the South American plate. It starts moving toward Europe. Without the plate movement, there, there wouldn't be any mountain on this planet. Professor Gerard Stamfley of Lausanne University in Switzerland studies the processes that built the Alps. The African and Eurasian plates start to move toward each other, trapping a third, smaller Iberian plate between them. The three plates collide. The Eurasian plate is pushed downward into the mantle, chopping off the Iberian plate. The Tethys Sea begins to close. As the Eurasian plate grinds underneath the African plate, it pushes the Tethys Sea floor and part of the Iberian plate 600 miles north and many thousands of feet into the air. Rocks that started life on the bottom of the ocean end up at the top of the Alps. Quite fascinating to, to imagine that if you are on top of the Matterhorn, you're actually staying on top of Africa. For geologists, Africa stops in the Alps. Over the next 100 million years, the continents continue to smash together. New mountain ranges start forming around the globe. The largest, the Himalayas, form as the Indian plate charges northward toward the Eurasian plate. It moves at two inches per year, lining up a head-on collision. The movement of the Indian plate leads to a clash between two giant continents and creates some of the highest structures ever to exist on Earth. The incredible power of continental drift not only builds mountains, it also sculpts one of the world's most recognizable landmarks, the Grand Canyon in Arizona. The Grand Canyon is a great scar on the surface of the Earth. Geologist Ron Blakey has been studying the canyon for over 30 years. It's just a wonderful place to come face to face with planet Earth. The Grand Canyon is 277 miles long and up to 18 miles wide. At its deepest, it stretches down for over a mile. The gorge exposes the interior of the North American continent. It's like looking through the pages of a book. Each layer tells a story about the past. is as we go up the walls of the Grand Canyon. It's just like going through a time machine. Layer upon layer of rock reveal the geological history of North America from present day to two billion years ago. The deeper you go, the older the rocks. By studying the layers, Blakey can piece together the history of the canyon he finds some of the most interesting evidence at the very top. Fossils of ocean creatures. 
Wow, this bed's the jackpot here. What we have is a extraordinary example of a Permian seafloor. The most important thing it tells us with respect to the Grand Canyon is that this area had to be near sea level when these rocks formed. Now it's 7,000 feet above sea level on the rim of the Grand Canyon. So something had to happen. Either the sea had to fall 7,000 feet, and we're pretty sure that didn't happen, or this landscape had to be uplifted 7,000 feet. We're pretty sure that happened. 250 million years ago, the canyon starts to form as a result of a collision between the Pacific and North American plates. They collide with such force, the North American plate thrusts more than two miles upward. What was once seabed rises over a period of 15 million years to form a vast plateau far above sea level. It stays that way for millions of years until it is transformed by water erosion. Six million years ago, several hundred miles south of the canyon, plate movements open up the Gulf of California to the sea. For the first time, small streams in the Rocky Mountains could empty into the ocean. So if we're starting a stream at 14,000 feet in the Rocky Mountains and carving down to sea level, and the Grand Canyon just happens to be in the way, the Grand Canyon's gonna get cut out. These streams merge to form what is now called the Colorado River. It cuts down through the land, heading to the Gulf of California. It took a river to carve the canyon. The water has carved down through the rocks, layer by layer by layer, removing material out of the canyon and leaving the great void that sits behind me. The Grand Canyon is a testament to the awesome power of the continents in shaping our world. Back on our journey, tracing the birth and death of the continents, it is now 20 million years ago. Two and a half thousand miles south of the Grand Canyon, another plate collision is about to take place. The map of the modern world is almost complete. At this time, water flowing freely between the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans still separates North and South America. Over many millions of years, the Pacific Plate begins sliding under the Caribbean Plate. The pressure causes underwater volcanoes to erupt. Some explode with such ferocity that they create a range of small islands between North and South America. Over the next 17 million years, ocean currents deposit sediment in gaps between these new islands. Gradually, the sediment builds up and compresses to form land bridges between the islands. Three million years ago, the Isthmus of Panama, a narrow strip of land, finally joins North and South America. It separates the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans. The flow of water between the two stops, and ocean currents must take new routes. This causes yet another change in the climate of our planet. It changes the movement of warm seas around the globe, disrupting weather patterns, possibly pushing the planet into an ice age. Many species are wiped out. The continents as we know them today are formed, creating the nice hospitable environment for human civilization to evolve and thrive on planet Earth. But how long will it last? The forces that power plate tectonics are still active and will tear our continents apart once again. They will build a new world, one that may trigger another mass extinction and push humanity to the brink of annihilation. A view from space reveals Earth's continents as we know them today. There are seven in total, but some are separated by a political divide rather than a geographical one. Africa Eurasia is a supercontinent comprising of Africa, Europe, and Asia. It stretches from the Siberian Plateau in Russia 
to the Cape of Good Hope in South Africa. A spectacular route across three continents, incorporating dramatic climate change, vivid scenery, and diverse cultures. However, Africa Eurasia isn't the only supercontinent on the planet. Because the Panama Isthmus links North and South America together, they too can be thought of as one vast landmass. And if the Bering Strait between Russia and Alaska were to freeze over, it would be possible to walk from Cape Horn in South America to the Cape of Good Hope in South Africa. A journey of around 25,000 miles. But this won't always be possible. For powerful forces deep below the surface continue to send the continents hurtling across the globe. A process that started at their birth 4.4 billion years ago and one which will continue long into their future. What we are observing at the moment is only a snapshot of the Earth's global cycle that has been undergone for the last four and a half billion years probably and will be undergone um, even if we're not around anymore. The global continental cycle has another impact on our world. It causes many natural disasters. Plate movement creates stress points which lead to volcanic eruptions. As continents split apart, instability at the plate junctions causes earthquakes that rip apart whole communities. This one, on October 8, 2005, in Pakistan-ruled Kashmir, killed nearly 75,000 people and left up to three million homeless. And when plates subduct into the earth, their death throes produce devastating waves. The 2004 Indonesian tsunami is just one demonstration of the terrifying power unleashed when plates move. Such natural disasters are part of the continental cycle and they're not going to stop. Plates moving is something we have to live with. There's nothing we can do about it. It's going to happen. There are going to be big earthquakes in California. There's going to be a lot of damage. There's going to be loss of life. In recent years, it seems as though natural disasters, powered by the movement of the continents, have been on the rise. But what we are witnessing is an increase in awareness rather than an increase in the number or severity of natural disasters. I think what we're really seeing here is a very raised consciousness of the public with instant communication abilities. Much more publicity is given to volcanic eruptions and earthquakes. We are observers to only a very short period of the life of the Earth. If we could monitor earthquakes and volcanic activity, caused by plate movements over millions of years, we would see a very different picture. When you look at something over 10 years, you might have 10 major earthquakes. The next 10 years, you might ha not have any, but that's not significant. It just is related to the short period of time that you're making the observation at. When you start looking at hundreds, thousands, and millions of years, all that averages out. It's impossible to predict exactly when the next disaster will occur. But it is possible to predict where it will happen. The plate boundaries. Map the location of earthquakes and volcanoes, and they line up with the cracks between plates. Plot where these plates will move over the next tens of millions of years, and the future looks bleak for many of the world's cities. So what will our world look like in the future? 50 million years from now, the Atlantic Ocean will widen, pushing New York further away from North Africa. Meanwhile, in the Southern Hemisphere, Australia will be on a collision course with Southeast Asia. And in Europe, Africa will head north, closing the Mediterranean Sea. A new mountain range will form where Italy and Greece once stood. Known as the Mediterranean Mountains, they will be as big as the Himalayas, extending from Spain across Southern Europe, through the Middle East, and into Asia. 100 million years in the future, 
and the power of continental movements will render the surface of the Earth unrecognizable. The Atlantic Ocean will continue to widen, but a subduction zone will form along its western shoreline. The first sign of it can be seen today in the Caribbean, the Puerto Rico Trench. This trench will grow north and south along the east coast of North and South America. This vast subduction zone will consume the Atlantic Ocean, dragging Europe and Africa back toward the Americas. 250 million years in the future, intergalactic explorers returning to their home planet will find a world very different to the one in their records. There will no longer be seven continents, but one gigantic landmass containing most of the land on Earth. They could find it a barren, frozen world. The explorers search for the remains of our cities. But when Europe and America collide, any cities along the coastlines will be gradually destroyed. The geological future of New York is uh, go going to be uh, rather traumatic. In the long term, uh, New York is going to be at the site of a continental collision. North America and Europe are going to collide with one another and produce a distinctive suite of rocks which will eventually be crumpled between the two continents as they collide. New York and its neighbors will be crushed and buried beneath the surface, leaving no more than a few remains. In the future, geologists will be able to find remains of New York City trapped in the rocks themselves, either buildings or plastic bottles or old autos and their parts. All of these things will be incorporated into the fossil record and will be recognizable to a future geologist who knows what she or he is looking for. Because of its similarities to past supercontinents, this future landmass is called Pangaea Ultima, the final Pangaea. Nearly all the landmasses in the world will be joined together. Pangaea Ultima will probably experience climate extremes, freezing winters and scorching summers. This deadly weather could have devastating effects on all life on Earth. The implications for the human race are interesting to speculate about. Certainly, the disposition of the continents over time will affect Earth's climate, and that will in turn have an influence on which organisms survive, which go extinct, and could be a factor in future mass extinctions. The world we know is inching slowly toward its own destruction. The processes that shape the surface of the Earth are never going to change. We're going to have earthquakes, we're going to have volcanoes, we're going to have tsunamis and hurricanes, regardless of whether humans inhabit the planet. And so the planet will always be here, probably. Plate tectonics will operate for the foreseeable few hundred million years. The question is whether humans will be here to witness it or not. But even Pangaea Ultima might not be the end of the story. The forces that created it may eventually rip it apart and start the cycle of death and rebirth again. But by then, the impact of colliding continents could have been too much for our species. With our cities destroyed and the climate severe, we may have already left our planet in search of a safer home. Planet Earth, hundreds of millions of years in the future. Intergalactic explorers return to their home planet in search of signs of ancient civilizations. They find a planet that has changed beyond recognition. Gone are the familiar continents that we know today. Instead, they find a giant landmass 
with huge mountain ranges, massive frozen snowfields and glaciers. The once thriving metropolis they seek has disappeared. A few broken remnants are all that remain, crushed and buried beneath tons of rock. Could this be a future vision of Earth? Naked Science asks, what forces could create such a bleak and barren world? And investigates how the awesome power of colliding continents shapes and reshapes our planet in an endless cycle of construction and destruction. space, it's easy to see the distinctive pattern of land that makes up the continents. North America, South America, Africa, Antarctica, Europe, Asia, and Australia. Giant land masses separated by oceans that stabilize the environment with hospitable weather patterns, suitable for civilization and cities to evolve and prosper. Now imagine our planet, ravaged by storm force winds, subjected to extremes of temperature, giant freezes, heat waves, and droughts. A world where cities are crushed and destroyed, where Africa tramples New York underfoot, and London freezes at the North Pole. The geological future of New York is uh, go going to be uh, rather traumatic. North America and Europe are going to collide with one another. The world as we know it will be unrecognizable. This is not a portrait of the Earth after a devastating global disaster. This is how nature will shape our planet many millions of years in the future. This incredible remodeling is just part of a natural cycle that has shaped the Earth for the last four billion years and will continue to do so until the sun finally destroys its surface once and for all. Today, our continents may seem solid, safe, and forever fixed in place, but they are none of those things. These great land masses are constantly on the move. Speed up the last few billion years, and one can see the continents sailing across the globe. Powerful forces deep within the planet rip the continents apart and then smash them together in an ever-changing cycle of death and rebirth. Oceans disappear, mountains crumble and rise again. Land masses form and reform. Colliding continents are the mightiest force on Earth. When we look at the history of planet Earth, we see that it is full of change. Change is, is part of nature. And this change continues today and will continue into the future. To understand how the continents shape our world, we must first travel back in time to the very birth of the Earth. Four and a half billion years ago, the Earth is created from the debris left over from the formation of the Sun. Dust and debris collide and clump together. Once these clumps grow into objects about half a mile in diameter, they create enough gravity to attract more material. Slowly, these clumps grow into as many as 20 planets. As these new planets orbit the Sun, they begin to collide. One collision with the planet Theia, which creates the Moon, obliterates the surface of the Earth. The energy from the collision makes the Earth incredibly hot. At around 11,000 degrees Fahrenheit, 
it's more than seven times hotter than the inside of a cremation furnace. Earth is a massive molten ball of boiling lava. This is primeval hell, where thousands of asteroids and comets bombard our world. But deep within the planet, a process starts that will lead to the first land. The heaviest elements, lead and nickel, sink down toward the center of the Earth to form a molten core. The lighter elements, including oxygen and silicon, rise toward the surface, where they erupt in volcanoes of molten rock. Slowly, the Earth's surface cools. Molten lava solidifies to form patches of crust, the seeds of the first continents. But even as the first land is born, it faces a battle to survive. We were being bombarded by a large number of asteroids very early in the history of the planet. So there's a lot of dynamic change from being walloped by giant impacts, disturbing things. Geology professor Sam Bowring is an expert in early Earth and the genesis of the continents. When we had a, an early crust is, is an interesting question. I suspect we've had, an, we had an early crust from day one. The question is, how long was that preserved? When the Earth was being bombarded constantly by asteroids, the chance of preserving any small chunk of that crust was very low. The relentless bombardment destroys the new planet's crust almost as soon as it forms. This recycling of the surface continues for many millions of years. But as the flux of asteroids began to wane, and as the Earth matured a little bit, I suspect the early crust lasted a little bit longer. Eventually, the barrage from asteroid impact slows down. The surface of the Earth continues to cool. But the Earth is missing one vital ingredient, oceans. Where Earth got its water has been a controversial topic over the years. Uh, I think most people now think that many meteoritic bodies actually contain quite a lot of water. Water carried by meteors and asteroids may form the oceans that surround the first continents. The Earth, 4.4 billion years ago. Our planet is now 150 million years old and the first primitive land masses have formed. They are not like the seven instantly recognizable continents of today. They are just small rafts of rock floating on the mantle. But now a type of rock appears on the Earth's surface that will form the nucleus of future continents. A rock buoyant enough not to sink into the bowels of the Earth. Granite. In South Africa, in the Kapval region southwest of Johannesburg, geologists examine ancient granite that has survived the ravages of time. These are the ancient remains of what some people consider to be the first true continent. We're looking at the, uh, at the relics, the remnants of uh, the first continental nuclei. This is one of the oldest, but certainly uh, the best preserved continental nucleus in the world. Geologist Alex Kister studies how granite formed the first continents. The rocks here are so important because they are remarkably well preserved, much better than anywhere on, on Earth. And that allows us actually to study processes that were involved in the formation of these early crustal rocks. Kisters is collecting samples to date the age of the granite. Uh, we're drilling these little rock cores, um, taking them out, and then sending off the later onto the lab to be dated. Dating rocks is a complex process because over long periods of time, the minerals can break down and reform into new rocks. Scientists look for an ingredient of rock that is tough enough to withstand the test of time. The answer is zircon, a crystal that is made inside molten rock as it solidifies. Even if the rock is destroyed, the zircons are durable enough to survive. Zircon is an incredibly interesting mineral and it incorporates uranium and excludes lead. And that sets us up to have basically nature's time capsule. To illustrate this process, 
Imagine that this hourglass is a newly formed zircon crystal. Sand in the top represents uranium. The sand in the bottom represents lead. Over millions of years, the uranium in the zircon turns into lead. Measuring the relative proportions of sand in the top and bottom of the glass reveals how much time has passed. Uranium's relentless decay into lead gives us a natural clock. Using this technique, geologists date this granite at three and a half billion years old. This makes it some of the oldest rock on the planet. These rocks make up a major part of what is known as the Kopval Kraton. A Kraton is an ancient raft of rock, light enough to float on the mantle and around which a continent will grow. Ancient Kratons have also been found in the heart of the Australian and North American continents. The Kraton here in Kopval in South Africa stretches for 463,000 square miles. It's almost twice the size of Texas. Without granite, the Kraton and modern continental crust wouldn't exist. Granite forms when minerals in the crust melt, then react with water, cool, and crystallize. Because it is made of lighter minerals, granite is less dense than other rock in the mantle, so it floats on the surface and mixes with other rocks to form rafts of land. The Kopval Kraton is not totally built from granite. The oldest rocks here are these amazing pillow lavas exposed along the Kamadi River. Three and a half billion years ago, they form under the sea as lava emerges from an underwater volcanic vent. Upon contact with water, the lava immediately gains a solid crust, which then cracks and oozes additional large blobs called pillows. These rocks are amongst the oldest that we know. It's basically identical to uh, pillow laws that we see on a recent ocean floor or in settings like Hawaii. The Kamadi pillow lavas begin their life on the ocean floor, but are pushed up out of the sea to form part of a continent. But where did the granite come from? To create it, you need the right mix of minerals. A new theory suggests that life itself may have provided the missing ingredients. Planet Earth, hundreds of millions of years in the future. Intergalactic explorers return to their home planet in search of signs of ancient civilizations. They find a planet that has changed beyond recognition. Gone are the familiar continents that we know today. Instead, they find a giant landmass with huge mountain ranges, massive frozen snowfields and glaciers. The once thriving metropolis they seek has disappeared. A few broken remnants are all that remain, crushed and buried beneath tons of rock. Could this be a future vision of Earth? Naked Science asks, what forces could create such a bleak and barren world? And investigates how the awesome power of colliding continents shapes and reshapes our planet in an endless cycle of construction and destruction. space, it's easy to see the distinctive pattern of land that makes up the continents. North America, South America, Africa, Antarctica, Europe, Asia, and Australia. Giant land masses separated by oceans that stabilize the environment with hospitable weather patterns 
suitable for civilization and 